Chapter 19 North and South This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Marie, South Tyneside, United Kingdom. North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter 19 Angel Visits. As angels in some brighter dreams call to the soul when man doth sleep, so some strange thoughts transcend our wanted themes, and into glory peep. Henry Vaughan Mrs. Hale was curiously amused and interested by the idea of the Thornton dinner party. She kept wondering about the details, with something of the simplicity of a little child who wants to have all its anticipated pleasures described beforehand. But the monotonous life led by invalids often makes them like children, inasmuch as they have, neither of them, any sense of proportion in events, and seem each to believe that the walls and curtains, which shut in their world, and shut out everything else, must of necessity be larger than anything hidden beyond. Besides, Mrs. Hale had had her vanities as a girl, had perhaps unduly felt their mortification when she became a poor clergyman's wife. They had been smothered and kept down, but they were not extinct. And she liked to think of seeing Margaret dressed for a party, and discussed what she should wear with an unsettled anxiety that amused Margaret, who had been more accustomed to society in her one year in Harley Street than her mother in five and twenty years of Helston. Then, you think you shall wear your white silk? Are you sure it will fit? It's nearly a year since Edith was married. Oh, yes, Mamma. Mrs. Murray made it, and it's sure to be right. It may be a straw's breadth shorter or longer wasted, according to my having grown fat or thin, but I don't think I've altered in the least. Hadn't you better let Dixon see it? It may have gone yellow with lying by. If you like, Mamma. But if the worst comes to the worst, I've a very nice pink gauze which Aunt Shaw gave me, only two or three months before Edith was married. That can't have gone yellow. "'No, but it may have faded. "'Well, then I've a green silk. "'I feel more as if it was the embarrassment of riches. "'I wish I knew what you ought to wear,' said Mrs. Hale nervously. "'Margaret's manner changed instantly. "'Shall I go and put them on one after another, Mamma, "'And then you could see which you like best. "'But, yes, perhaps that will be best.' So off Margaret went. She was very much inclined to play some pranks when she was dressed up at such an unusual hour. To make her rich white silk balloon out into a cheese. To retreat backwards from her mother as if she were the queen. But when she found that these freaks of hers were regarded as interruptions to the serious business, and as such annoyed her mother, she became grave and sedate. What had possessed the world, her world, to fidget so about her dress, she could not understand. But that very afternoon, on naming her engagement to Bessie Higgins, apropos of the servant that Mrs Thornton had promised to inquire about, Bessie quite roused up at the intelligence. "'Dear, and are you going to dine at Thornton's at Marlborough Mills?' "'Yes, Bessie. Why are you so surprised?' "'Oh, I don't know.' "'But they visit we all the first folk in Milton.' "'And you don't think we're quite the first folk in Milton, eh, Bessie?' "'Bessie's cheeks flushed a little, at her thought being thus easily read. "'Well,' said she, "'you see, they're thinking a deal of money here, "'and I reckon you've not getting much.' "'No,' said Margaret, "'that's very true. "'But we are educated people, "'and have lived amongst educated people.' Is there anything so wonderful in our being asked to out to dinner by a man who owns himself inferior to my father by coming to him to be instructed? I don't mean to blame Mr Thornton. Few draper's assistants, as he was once, could have made themselves what he is. But can you give dinners back in your small house? Thornton's house is three times as big. Well, I think we could manage to give Mr Thornton a dinner back, as you call it. Perhaps not in such a large room, nor with so many people. But I don't think we thought about it at all in that way. I never thought you'd be dining with Thorndon's, repeated Bessie. 
Why, the Mary Cell dines there, and the members of Parliament and all. I think I could support the honour of meeting the Mayor of Milton. But them ladies dress so grand, said Bessie, with an anxious look at Margaret's print gown, which her Milton eyes appraised at seven pence a yard. Margaret's face dimpled up into a merry laugh. Thank you, Bessie, for thinking so kindly about my looking nice among all the smart people. But I've plenty of grand gowns. A week ago, I should have said they were far too grand for anything I should ever want again. But as I'm to dine at Mr Thornton's, and perhaps to meet the mayor, I shall put on my very best gown, you may be sure. What win you wear? asked Bessie, somewhat relieved. White silk, said Margaret. A gown I had for a cousin's wedding a year ago. That'll do, said Bessie, falling back in her chair. I should be loath to have you look down upon. Oh, I'll be fine enough if that will save me from being looked down upon in Milton. I wish I could see you dressed up, said Bessie. I reckon you're not what folk would call pretty. You've not red and white enough for that. But don't you know, I had dreamt of you long afore I ever seed you. Nonsense, Bessie. Ay, but I did. Your very face, looking with your clear steadfast eyes out of the darkness, with your hair blown off from your brow, and going out like rays round your forehead, which was just as smooth and as straight as it is now, and you always came to give me strength, which I seemed to gather out from your deep comfort and eyes, and you were dressed in shine and raiment, just as you're going to be dressed. So you see, it was you. Nay, Bessie, said Margaret gently. It was but a dream. And why may nay I dream a dream in my affliction as well as others? Did not many a one in the Bible? Aye, and see visions too. Why, even me father thinks a deal of dreams. I tell you again, I saw you as plainly coming swiftly towards me with your hair blown back with the very swiftness of the motion, just like the way it grows, a little standing off like, and the white shine and dress on you've getting to wear. Let me come and see you in it. I want to see you and touch you as in the very deed you were in my dream. My dear Bessie, it is quite a fancy of yours. Fancy or no fancy, you've come, as I knew you would, when I saw your movement in my dream. And when you hear about me, I reckon I feel easier in my mind, and comforted, just as a fire comforts one on a dree day. You said it were on the 21st. Please, God, I'll come and see you. Oh, Bessie, you may come, and welcome. But don't talk so. It really makes me sorry. It does indeed. Then I'll keep it to myself if I bite my tongue out. Not but what it's true for all that. Margaret was silent. At last, she said, Let us talk about it sometimes, if you think it true. But not now. Tell me. How's your father turned out? Aye, said Bessie heavily, in a manner very different from that she had spoken in but a minute or two before. He and many another, all hump as men, and many a one besides. The women are as bad as the men in their savageness this time. Food is high, and the mun have food for their children, I reckon. Suppose Thornton sent him the dinner out, the same money spent on potatoes and meal would keep many a crying babby quiet and hush up its mother's heart for a bit. Don't speak so, said Margaret. You'll make me feel wicked and guilty in going to this dinner. No, said Bessie. Some's pre-elected to sumptuous feasts and purple and fine linen. Maybe you're on in em. Others toil and moil all their lives long, and the very dogs are not pitiful in our days as they were in the days of Lazarus. But if you ask me to cool your tongue with the tip of me finger... I'll come across the great gulf to you, just for the thought of what you've been to me here. Bessie, you're very feverish. I can tell it in the touch of your hand, as well as in what you're saying. It won't be division enough in that awful day that some of us have been beggars here, and some of us have been rich. We shall not be judged by that poor accident, but by our faithful following of Christ. Margaret got up and found some water and soaking her pocket handkerchief in it, 
she laid the cool wetness on Bessie's forehead and began to chafe the stone-cold feet. Bessie shut her eyes and allowed herself to be soothed. At last, she said, you'd have been deaved out of your five wits as well as me if you'd had one body after another coming in to ask for father and staying to tell me each one their tale. Some spoke a deadly hatred and made my blood run cold with the terrible things they said of the masters. But more, being women, kept plaining, plaining with the tears running down their cheeks and never wiped away, nor heeded, of the price of meat and how their children couldn't sleep at night for the hunger. And do they think the strike will mend this? asked Margaret. They say so, replied Bessie. They do say trade has been good for long, and the masters has made no end of money. How much father doesn't know, but in course the union does, and as is natural, they want their share of the profits, now that the food is getting dear. And the union says they'll not be doing their duty if they don't make the masters give them their share. But masters is getting the upper hand somehow, and I'm feared they'll keep it now, and ever more. It's like the great battle at Armageddon, the way they keep on grinning and fighting at each other, till even while they fight, they are picked off into the pit. Just then, Nicholas Higgins came in. He caught his daughter's last words. Aye, and I'll fight on too, and I'll get it this time. It'll not take long for to make em give in, for they've getting a pretty lot of orders all under contract, and they'll soon find out they'd better give us our five per cent than lose the profit they'll gain, let alone the fine for not fulfilling the contract. <laughs> My masters! I know who'll win. Margaret fancied from his manner that he must have been drinking, not so much from what he said as from the excited way in which he spoke, and she was rather confirmed in this idea by the evident anxiety Bessie showed to hasten her departure. Bessie said to her, The twenty-first, that's Thursday week. I may come and see you dress for Thornton's, I reckon. What time is your dinner? Before Margaret could answer, Higgins broke out. Thorndon's? I'd go to dine at Thorndon's. Ask him to give you a bumper to the success of his orders. By the 21st, I reckon he'll be potted in his brains how to get him done in time. Tell him the 700'll come marching into Marlborough Mills the morning after he gives the 5% and will help him through his contract in no time. You'll have them all there. My master, Hamper, he's one of the old-fashioned sort. Ne'er meets a man bout an oath or a curse. I should think he were going to die if he spoke to me civil. But after all, his bark's worse than his bite, and you may tell him one of his turnouts said so if you like. <laughs> but you'll have a lot of prize mill owners at Thorndon's. I should like to get speech of them when they're a bit inclined to sit still after dinner and couldn't have run for the life in them. I'd tell him he mind. I'd speak up again the hard way they're driving on us. Goodbye, said Margaret hastily. Goodbye, Bessie. I shall look to see you on the 21st, if you're well enough. The medicines and treatment which Dr. Donaldson had ordered for Mrs. Hale did her so much good at first that not only she herself, but Margaret began to hope that he might have been mistaken and that she could recover permanently. As for Mr. Hale, although he had never had an idea of the serious nature of their apprehensions, he triumphed over their fears with an evident relief, which proved how much his glimpse into the nature of them had affected him. Only Dixon croaked forever into Margaret's ear. However, Margaret defied the raven and would hope. They needed this gleam of brightness indoors, for out of doors, even to their uninstructed eyes, there was a gloomy brooding appearance of discontent. Mr. Hale had his own acquaintances among the working men, and was depressed with their earnestly told tales of suffering and long endurance. They would have scorned to speak of what they had to bear to anyone who might, from his position, have understood it without their words. But here was this man from a distant county, who was perplexed by the workings of the system into the midst of which he was thrown, and each was eager to make him a judge, and to bring witness of his own causes for irritation. 
Then Mr. Hale brought all his budget of grievances and laid it before Mr. Thornton, for him, with his experience as a master, to arrange them and explain their origin, which he always did on sound economical principles, showing that, as trade was conducted, there must always be a waxing and waning of commercial prosperity, and that in the waning, a certain number of masters, as well as of men, must go down into ruin, and be no more seen among the ranks of the happy and prosperous. He spoke as if this consequence were so entirely logical, that neither employers nor employed had any right to complain if it became their fate. The employer, to turn aside from the race he could no longer run, with a bitter sense of incompetency and failure, wounded in the struggle, trampled down by his fellows in their haste to get rich, slighted where he once was honoured, humbly asking for, instead of bestowing, employment with a lordly hand. Of course, speaking so of the fate that, as a master, might be his own in the fluctuations of commerce, he was not likely to have more sympathy with that of the workmen, who were passed by in the swift, merciless improvement or alteration, who would fain lie down and quietly die out of the world that needed them not, but felt as if they could never rest in their graves, for the clinging cries of the beloved and helpless they would leave behind. Who envied the power of the wild bird, that can feed her young with her very heart's blood? Margaret's whole soul rose up against him while he reasoned in this way, as if commerce were everything and humanity nothing, she could hardly thank him for the individual kindness which brought him that very evening to offer her, for the delicacy which made him understand that he must offer her privately, every convenience for illness that his own wealth or his mother's foresight had caused them to accumulate in their household, and which, as he learned from Dr. Donaldson, Mrs. Hale might possibly require. His presence, after the way he had spoken, his bringing before her the doom which she was vainly trying to persuade herself might yet be averted from her mother, all conspired to set Margaret's teeth on edge as she looked at him and listened to him. What business had he to be the only person, except Dr. Donaldson and Dixon, admitted to the awful secret which he held shut up in the most dark and sacred recess of her heart, not daring to look at it unless she invoked heavenly strength to bear the sight that, some day soon, she should cry aloud for her mother, and no answer would come out of the blank, dumb darkness. Yet he knew all. She saw it in his pitying eyes. She heard it in his grave and tremulous voice. How reconcile those eyes, that voice, with the hard, reasoning, dry, merciless way in which he laid down axioms of trade, and serenely followed them out to their full consequences? The discord jarred upon her, inexpressibly, the more because of the gathering war of which she heard from Bessie. To be sure, Nicholas Higgins, the father, spoke differently. He had been appointed a committee man, and said that he knew secrets of which the exoteric knew nothing. He said this more expressly and particularly on the very day before Mrs. Thornton's dinner party, when Margaret, going in to speak to Bessie, found him arguing the point with Boucher, the neighbour of whom she had frequently heard mention, as by turns exciting Higgins' compassion, as an unskilful workman with a large family depending upon him for support, and at other times enraging his more energetic and sanguine neighbour by his want of what the latter called spirit. It was very evident that Higgins was in a passion when Margaret entered, Boucher stood with both hands on the rather high mantelpiece, swaying himself a little on the support which his arms, thus placed, gave him, and looking wildly into the fire, with a kind of despair that irritated Higgins, even while it went to his heart. Bessie was rocking herself violently backwards and forwards, as was her wont, Margaret knew by this time, when she was agitated. Her sister Mary was tying on her bonnet in great clumsy bows as suited her great clumsy fingers to go to her fustian cutting, blubbering out loud the while and evidently longing to be away from a scene that distressed her. 
Margaret came in upon this scene. She stood for a moment at the door. Then, her finger on her lips, she stole to a seat on the squab near Bessie. Nicholas saw her come in, and greeted her with a gruff but not unfriendly nod. Mary hurried out of the house, catching gladly at the open door, and crying aloud when she got away from her father's presence. It was only John Boucher, that took no notice whatever, who came in, and who went out. "'It's no use, Higgins. Who cannot live long at this, and has just sinking away. Not for want to meet herself, but because I cannot stand the sight of the little ones, Clemen. Ay, Clemen. Five shilling a week may do well enough for thee, with but two mouths to fill, and one an emma wench who can well yearn her own meat. But it's Clement to us. And I tell thee plain, if her dies, as I'm feared I will afore we've getting the five per cent, I'll fling the money back at the master's face and say, Be dumb to you. Be dumb to the whole cruel world of you. That couldn't leave me the best wife that ever bore children to a man. And look thee, lad, I'll hate thee and the whole pack of the union. Aye, and chase you through heaven with me hatred. I will, lad. I will. If you're leading me astray of this matter, thou saidst Nicholas on Wednesday to night, and now it's Tuesday of the second week, that afore a fortnight would have the masters coming a begging to us to take back our work at our own wage, and time's nearly up, and there's our little Jack lying a bed, too weak to cry, but just every now and then sobbing up his heart for want of food. Our little Jack, I tell thee, lad has never looked up since he were born, and a loves him as if he were a very life, as he is, for I reckon he'll cost me that precious price. Our oh, little Jack, who wakened me each morn with putting his sweet little lips to me great ruffful face, a seeking a smooth place to kiss. And he lies, Clement! Here the deep sobs choked the poor man, and Nicholas looked up, with eyes brimful of tears, to Margaret, before he could gain courage to speak. Hold up, man. Thy little Jack shall gnaw Clem. I ha getting brass, and will go buy the chap a sup of milk and a good four pounder this very minute. What's mine's thine, sure enough, i thou's de want. Only do not lose heart, man, continued he, as he fumbled in the teapot for what money he had. I lay you, my heart and soul will win for all this. It's but bearing on one more week, and you just see the way the masters will come round, praying on us to come back to our mills. And the union, that's to say, ah, will take care you've enough for the children and the missus. So don't turn faint heart, and go to the tyrants a seeking work. The man turned round at these words turned round a face so white and gaunt and tear furrowed and hopeless that its very calm forced Margaret to weep. You know well that a worse a tyrant than e'er the masters were says, clem to death, and see him all clem to death ere you dare go again the union. You know it well, Nicholas, for a you're one in em. You may be kind hearts each separate, but once banded together, you've no more pity for a man than a wild, hunger-maddened wolf. Nicholas had his hand on the lock of the door. He stopped and turned round on Boucher, close following. So help me God, man alive, if I think not I'm doing best for thee and for all in us. If I'm going wrong when I think I'm going right, it's their sin who will left me where I am, in my ignorance. I have thought till my brains ached. Believe me, John, I have. And I say again, there's no help for us but having faith in the union. They'll win the day. See if they done it. Not one word had Margaret or Bessie spoken. They had hardly uttered the sighing that the eyes of each called to the other to bring up from the depths of her heart. At last Bessie said, 
I never thought to hear Father call on God again. But you heard him say, so help me God. Yes, said Margaret. Let me bring you what money I can spare. Let me bring you a little food for that poor man's children. Don't let them know it comes from any one but your father. It will be but little. Bessie lay back without taking any notice of what Margaret said. She did not cry. She only quivered up her breath. My heart's drained dry, your tears, she said. Bouch has been in these days past, a telling me of his fears and his troubles. He's but a weak kind of chap, I know, but he's a man for all that. And though I've been angry many a time afore now, with him and his wife, as knew no more nor him out to manage, yet, you see, all folks isn't wise, yet God lets them live. Aye, and gives them someone to love and be loved by, just as good as Solomon. And if sorrow comes to them they love, it hurts them as sore as e'er it did Solomon. I can't make it out. Perhaps it's as well such a one as Boucher has the union to see after him. But I'd just like for to see the men as make the union and put them one by one face to face with Boucher. I reckon if they heard him, They'd tell him if I cotched him one by one, he might go back and get what he could for his work, even if it weren't so much as they ordered. Margaret sat utterly silent. How was she ever to go away into comfort and forget that man's voice, with the tone of unutterable agony, telling more by far than his words of what he had to suffer? She took out her purse. She had not much in it of what she could call her own, but what she had she put into Bessie's hand without speaking. Thank you. There's many in em gets no more, and is not so bad off. Leastways, does not show it as he does. But father won't let them want, now he knows. You see, Pouch has been pulled down with his shoulder, and her being so cranky, and all the good pawn has gone this last twelve month. You're not to think we're a letting them clem, for all we're a bit pressed ourselves. If neighbours doesn't see after neighbours, I don't know who will. Bessie seemed almost afraid, lest Margaret should think that they had not the will, and to a certain degree, the power of helping one whom she evidently regarded as having a claim upon them. Besides, she went on, Father is sure and positive the masters must give in within these next few days, that they canna hold on much longer. But I thank you all the same. I thank you for me sell as much as for Boucher, for it just makes my heart warm to you more and more. Bessie seemed much quieter today, but fearfully languid and exhausted. As she finished speaking, she looked so faint and weary that Margaret became alarmed. <laughs> it's nought, said Bessie. It's not death yet. I had a fear for night with dreams, or somewhat like dreams, for I were wide awake, and I'm all in a swooned and dazed today. Only yon poor chap made me alive again. No, it's not death yet. But death is not far off. Aye, cover me up and I'll maybe sleep, if the cough will let me. Good night. Good afternoon, Mappin, I should say. But the light is dim and misty today. End of chapter 19